all get into order, please. Can, can everybody hear me okay? Okay, good. Can I welcome everybody to uh, this cabinet meeting? Um, I'm conscious that we're here, most people are here for the discussion around the budget, but there's just a few um, initial it, uh, items we need to deal with, so just please bear, bear with us. Um, item one is the Members Code of Conduct, Declarations of Interest. Can I ask whether any members of the Cabinet wish to declare any interests? No? Okay. Uh, item two of the minutes of the last meeting. Um, can we agree that I'll sign them as a true record? Is that agreed? <coughs> Okay. Item 3 is the Leaders Update Executive Key Decisions Taken Under, taken under Delegated Powers. Um, we just need to note these. Is that, are they noted? Yeah. Okay. 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 okay, that takes us on, on to, uh, again, some of the initial financial reports. The Item 4 is the Revenue Monitoring Report for quarter three to December 2015. Uh, I'm pleased to report that we are projecting now a forecast of an £80,000 year overspend, um, which I think is a really good um, result, given that I can remember not so long ago we, uh, we inherited on this council £17 million overspend, so to have an £80,000 overspend is, I think, uh, is a really good achievement. So, uh, I just want to uh, ensure that we kind of recognise that. Um, I'll just ask Cameron to turn to the recommendations on page two. Um, can we agree those recommendations? Agreed. Thank you. That then takes us on then to item five, the capital monitoring uh, quarter three report for 2015-16, page 17 of your agenda. Uh, again, I don't uh, propose to go through this in any detail, but again, I think um, some important capital projects there in our capital programme that uh, we, we need to just note. But the recommendations are contained on um, page 17, so I'll just ask Cabinet, can we, can we agree those recommendations? Okay, thank you. It takes it on to, then to item uh, number 6, the annual report for 2015-16. Um, so this is uh, an update really, or a progress report on the work we've been doing around the 2020 plan. Um, and people obviously have got reports in front of them. You can see the uh, progress that we've made on uh, the, the 20 pledges. I think we've made some really good progress. Um, I, you know, I think the fact that we only agreed this in July um, and we're sort of six, seven months into sort of the financial year, I think it's a good platform for further progress. So I really just ask us to um, note the contents of that annual report. Can, can we agree with that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, we move on now to item seven, which is the budget consultation findings. So clearly um, we, we've engaged in quite a, a wide-ranging uh, budget consultation process this year um, around the budget options and uh, as the report says over, over 10,000 local people have, have taken part in, in that exercise. I, I do want to formally thank all members of the public who have taken the, the time and the trouble to reply to the questionnaire and engage in the, in the budget process. I think 10,000 is, is probably our best um, uh, uh, achievement yet in terms of the numbers of people participating, which I think is really good. And I'd also uh, like to um, thank, um, as well as residents, staff and, and other stakeholders uh, who have taken part, and also particularly the, uh, the scrutiny, three scrutiny committees who uh, looked at the budget options in, in some detail. And just to, to make the point that all of that feedback from the consultation we have looked at very closely and, and has informed our uh, proposals that I'll go through in a second on the, on the budgets uh, that were uh, going to be tabled for next year. So, um, 
I'll just ask you to turn to the recommendations on page 80. Um, as well as just noting the consultation process um, <coughs> that I've talked about, can, can we also particularly say, I mean, to say that we're, we're really um, grateful and thank everyone who's, who's taken part. I think it's, um, uh, it, it's something that I, I really do appreciate as a leader. I think it's important that we do um, give people the opportunity to comment. So, uh, and item two is we note the consultation findings within this report. Um, and the, the feedback from the Policy and Performance Committee members. Uh, and as I say, that feeds into to, to the next item, which is actually the budget itself. So, can we agree on those recommendations? <coughs> Thank you very much. <coughs> okay, so that brings us then to the main item of this morning, which is the Council um, budget. Um, I'm going to suggest that we, we deal with this item in the following way. So, first of all, uh, I've agreed to the uh, two trade union reps, uh, Paddy Cleary from Unison and Alan Small from Unite, to address the cabinet for up to five minutes. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll call for, um, uh, for, for those comments to be made in a second. Um, I'm then going to um, propose uh, a set of, of uh, proposals. I've got a resolution which is, is a draft resolution for discussion to the cabinet this morning. Um, we'll circulate that um, to, uh, to people who are in attendance here today so you can see what we're uh, talking about. And then um, Councillor Tony Smith, cabinet member for uh, children's services, will uh, move, propose the school's budget, and then we'll do a, um, a vote on all of those items on item people okay with that as a, as a way of dealing with this? Okay. Right, okay, so without further ado, can I, can I, I don't know who wants to go first, Paddy or Alan? Alan, do you want to come up to the mic and address the camera, please? Thank you.
using other providers in the future for lesser services, why would we, we be separating Peach Wood now? It should stay within the rest. I think we should invest in our lesser centres. I think it's been proven over a period of time we've invested in West Kirby Concourse, we've invested in Kinney Gap, we're, we're proposing an, an, an investment going to go to Joe. I think it's been a great success. We should continue what we're doing and invest in all our legislative centres and provide good quality services for the people of Wales. It's a no brainer. We, we, we look at people from different age groups of 16 to, uh, and I, I know there was a fellow in the West Cape, 92 years of age, having an induction last week. Now that, that is brilliant for me. We want to see people using our centres and, and, and long may continue. If it goes out to the independent sector or, or another provider, the, the, the temptation for people to, to save money, to save money on staffing costs, building costs, going, buildings going into disrepair, we believe they should stay in house. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
they face when the permission is not made directly from a local authority. The savings targets are optimistic, more than land we've continually used. We've actually used over 9 million pounds worth of reserves to balance our books this year. At the time when the users, their families, the public and staff see furniture getting delivered for £60,000, see strategic directors, okay, all above board, leaving with £250,000 packages. It just doesn't sit right with people. Some of the other consultations we've had around the library services that we provide, we've had to walk away from. We have not seen them as meaningful. There is no actual evidence who's available to look at these library services, who's interested in taking these up. We walked away from consultations. We're not going to, to, to bang our head on the drum. We understand totally what people are facing out there. We understand the pressures that we're faced for at the council. But all our provision needs to be looked at properly. To put into, into the voluntary sector, there's just clear, no clear evidence who, who was into Soft market testing was withdrawn. It was clearly a shocking access exercise to put our staff through those one-to-one -one consultations. We need to drop these two proposals in, 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 the, in the meantime. And I thank you for your time today.
the localization of business rates, uh, we, we have calculated that unless a, any kind of top-up uh, formula is given, will result in this council losing around six million. And I think perhaps the most, um, I think, objectionable change that uh, I think we've seen is the government's decision to effectively abdicate their responsibility for funding health and social care by basically saying to councils, if you want to increase the budget, you're going to have to get lo local council taxpayers to pay for it via a, an adult social care level of 2%. Um, and I just think that, given that we, particularly as we know, got an aging population in Wizzle, that is particularly a retrograde step. Um, the, the issue about, about the council tax, about making us pay for that, making local people pay back for the council tax, is that clearly um, in, in poorer authorities, particularly in areas like rural and Merseyside, we've got a lot of our properties in back as A and B, and therefore we, that we raise nowhere near as much money as the more affluent councils in the south of England. Um, and I just think this will just um, increase the gap between the prosperous areas in the south and the more deprived areas in the north. And, and, and I, just, um, I just think that's, uh, you know, the government talk about northern powerhouse. Well, you know, I, I don't know where, where we're going to get in Wurrgall to be a northern powerhouse if we're going to get such a huge hit on our funding. Um, of course, we, we also saw um, what I thought was an amazing uh, development a couple of weeks ago where the government suddenly seemed to find £300 million in what they call transitional funding for authorities that had lost the, this revenue support grant. Um, and how much should that did Wirral get? Well, the answer is zero. Um, where did the money go? Uh, the money went to uh, Surrey, Hertfordshire, Hampshire. Um, David Cameron's Council of Oxfordshire got £9 million. And the Chancellor of the, the Exchequer's uh, Council of Cheshire East got, I think, about four, four to six million. Uh, I just think, in any, in any sense of fairness, has completely gone out of the, the, of the system now. And, you know, the, the fact that none of us in, in Merseyside or, or in the North, in fact, the only, the only two metropolitan councils who, who, who uh, benefited this, from this money were both Conservative controlled. Um, you know, and I just think it's, it's gerrymandering at the worst, at the worst time. We've estimated that our share of that million should have been at least two million. So I think the question needs to be uh, asked of the government, where is our, where is our fair share of, of that money? So all of that uh, means that we are looking at some pretty horrendous uh, savings uh, over the next five years. We, we know that we've got savings. Uh, target of 28 million to make in 1617, but it's 129 million over the next five years um, as a result of these, of these changing. And we know that these cuts are coming at a time when, as I say, we've got an aging population, and arguably uh, we've got um, an even uh, we've got to make, meet even greater needs as a result of the, uh, the other cuts that we're making, welfare benefits, etc., etc. So, um, you know, my, my concern is the government basically saying we're, we're disengaging from local government, but the needs of our residents still need to be met. Um, and that's a big, big challenge for us going forward. But, uh, you know, for me, these cuts are unfair and, and just cannot be justified in, in any shape or form. And I, um, you know, I believe that it is absolutely imperative that we as a council continue to lobby the government to change course on the way they are um, uh, funding local governments uh, or not funding local governments and I, I call on all elected members of all parties to join us in, in that effort. H having said that, the resolution then goes on to talk about the, the, the budget specifically for 1617 and, and as I mentioned in my earlier comments, I'm, um, I think it is, it is important that we've done this as a collaborative effort so we have engaged with residents, we have engaged uh, with other stakeholders and, I, and the scrutiny committee, I think all of those um, people who've taken part and they have all that feedback is, is fed into our deliberations about the budget. Um, on page three of the resolution, I just want to talk very briefly about the uh, 2020 plan, which remains the, the key document for us in terms of planning 
uh, services over the next five years. You know, as we all know, that was agreed unanimously uh, by this council in July of last year. And I think it's it's important to say that even though we are facing um, huge uh, cuts, as I've described, um, we will still be spending around 260 million on on delivering you know those key services that the 2020 plan talks about. Um, and I, I do genuinely believe that we will be um, spending a lot of money uh, on um, uh, protecting vulnerable people. Uh, 70 million, our adult social care budget is 70 million next year. Our children's budget is around the same. We'll be spending additional money. We'll be spending two million pounds on uh, tackling antisocial behaviour, which was a key priority from the residence survey that Maury uh, did for us recently. Um, we'll be spending money on improving our environment getting our recycling rates uh, increased and also uh, clamping down on litter and a, and a particular drive on um, clamping down on, on uh, people that their dogs foul pavement on the highway. I know Burning Burning Moody our campus member environment is, um, is doing some great work around that. I think um, the, the, the other main point I want to make on the, the uh, next five years and the budget cuts is it, we're going to have to redouble our efforts, I believe, in coming up with new, uh, new and innovative ways of delivering services because given the scale of the cuts we're facing, the current model that we've got, I don't think it's sustainable. So I think we've made good progress in the last year with the two new companies we set up, Rural Evolutions around the Day Centre and Ed Centrals around the shared services with schools that we've done in conjunction with Cheshire West. Uh, and Chester Council, but I think we need to do a lot more of that going forward. We need to look at um, models such as trusts and social enterprises um, because we need to come up with um, ways of levering in new income streams to this council because we simply won't have the, um, the public funding to, uh, to deliver that um, agenda going forward. I think um, the, the other area that I'm really pleased that we'll be making a lot of progress on over the next year is. Uh, the whole area about bringing jobs uh, and investment into the world. Um, we've recently publicised our plans for Birkenhead, Head, Birkenhead, uh, regenerating Birkenhead Town Centre. Um, <coughs> we're working very closely with the Chamber of Commerce around the business improvement district there. There are some exciting projects that are in the pipeline for Royal Waters and World Golf Resorts in, in Royal Lake. So I, I firmly believe that creating jobs and investment is, is essential. It's a, it's a key way of helping people to, to have a pathway out of poverty and, and the council, I believe, should rightly continue to uh, place a very high priority through our growth plan on, on, that, um, on that regeneration and that investment. Um, I think the other, the other point I wanted to make around the, the, the overall funding situation, and this is a point that we, we make in the 2020 plan, but I think you know it's important to keep on inside. This is not just about the 200, 200 odd million budget that the council um, has available, it's about 2 billion that the public sector as a whole in the world um, can bring to the table. And as important as these new uh, models of service delivery will be us working um, in a more integrated way with our partners in health, fire, police, and the other public agencies. And we, we need to see this as a rural wide um, plan, which it, which it is. I'm really pleased that the other partners have taken on board our, um, our, our pledge, 20 pledges. So, um, a lot to be done <coughs> around the transformational change agenda in the next uh, 12 months and beyond. <coughs> so, um, I now want to focus even more uh, specifically on the budget for next year and uh, specifically talk about some of the difficult decisions because you can't, I don't believe you can take out 28 million from the budget or 29 million without having to make some difficult decisions. Um, but I think the important point to make is as a responsible administration we will balance the budget. We believe that is our duty as the administration we will uh, fulfil that duty um, uh, uh, next year. Um, I, I want to talk particularly about the, the issues to do with Gertrude Court because um, there's been a lot of comments and, and debate and um, uh, both the Treasury and Reps referred to, to that issue this morning. And 
I think for, for me, um, I absolutely get the fact that this is a, a really um, this is a really important issue, and that there's a lot of, of fear around. I, I get that from the uh, families and the service users of that facility, and obviously, I want to do everything we can to kind of minimise that. I think I just want to kind of emphasise the issue for, for Gertrude Call for me is not purely around budgetary savings. I think there is a, an important agenda that we are trying to uh, develop here around giving um, people with disabilities greater choice and independence. I would just make a plea really that um, there is clearly a statutory consultation process <coughs> taking place. And we need to let that yeah. take its course. Um, uh, I, I, uh, I am aware that there are one-to-one -one meetings taking place uh, as we speak with the uh, service users, the families, the carers. I think we need to let that process take its course. Um, but I would just, just make a plea to allow uh, the officers to sit down with, with all of those families and just, just explore what alternatives there are around. Um, <laughs> And, me and, and you. Excuse me. And I think um, I think once that uh, process is complete, I think we will all want reassurance that there are the, the alternatives are viable. And uh, I think the, the phrase that I used on the radio this morning is that we would want absolutely fundamentally the any alternative to be as good as or better than what is currently provided. But we're not there yet. We're not completing the, the individual one to ones. Um, but what this resolution is doing is giving, um, <coughs> instructing the, the, the current member for um, uh, adult social care and health, Councillor Chris Jones and the director, um, to obviously take uh, account of, of all that feedback. And you know, I'm, I'm not going to really impose an artificial timetable on that. We need to let that take its course, and then and then come up with a um, response to to that uh, feedback, which which. I think uh, uh, um, response to that agenda that I've set out around can we widen the, the choice that, that's available. Um, so that process will, will take place and we will give delegated authority to the cabinet member and the director to, to um, uh, take that decision. Um, I've seen quite a lot of publicity and I've had quite a lot of uh, information uh, from the um, uh, from various people about, about this whole agenda. Uh, can I just say for a second, what, what I won't do is take any lessons from the Conservatives on this council about reprobiding um, this, uh, this kind of service because it was the Conservatives in 2010 when they ran the council closed five um, care homes uh, for the very reasons that we're, we're looking at Gertrude Court. So I don't want, um, I, don't want uh, I think we shouldn't, we shouldn't be fooled into thinking that jumping on a particular bandwagon is the way to set budgets. Um, uh, so I just want to make, make that point. Um, in terms of the other uh, bits, the elements of the, the budget, I, if I can turn, actually to turn to uh, page seven um, on, on the budget proposal. And this uh, this addresses some of the points that both um, the particular Paddy uh, was raising, and clearly with what it has been raising. Uh, I just want to briefly touch on, on these these elements. So um, obviously in terms of the budget options that we, we surfaced with in December that we consulted on, uh, again we received lots of, a lot of representations, I first received a lot of representations about the welfare rights um, saving, um, closing the welfare rights unit. Can I say we're, we're proposing this morning that that saving is withdrawn for 16 and 17. And we're making that uh, recommendation on the basis that um, I do value, I think we do value the, the work that the Welfare Rights Union does. Arguably, um, given the cuts the government are making in welfare benefits and welfare rights, etc., uh, that their uh, services are going to be even more uh, valuable. But more importantly, as well as funding uh, an in house welfare rights team, we also fund a number of external agencies to do welfare rights work. I want to see a much more uh, rounded piece of work that reviews all of the money that we spend on welfare rights and, ma and to make sure that we're giving the best possible money for, money for that service. But we will not be proceeding with, with that saving in the 1617 financial year. 
Uh, if I can now move on to talk about libraries. Obviously, this is uh, an issue that we've uh, visited several times. Um, I mean, I, I remain uh, committed to looking at alternative uh, ways of delivering a good quality library service because of the funding uh, cuts that we're facing. I think we've got to look at that. Um, I pay tribute to the work that has been going on in a number of areas of the borough around getting more volunteers and friends groups involved in, in, the, in helping to run the library service. I'd particularly like to pay, pay tribute to Councillor Mike Sullivan, the uh, ward member for Pensby and Fingal, who has got a fantastic model going at Pensby Library uh, with a great group of, uh, of volunteers working there. I'd like to see more, uh, more of that uh, going forward. But I'm not convinced that we have got, as yet, a, a robust and sustainable plan in place for um, delivering a good quality library service going forward, um, yet still making a £203,000 saving. So we will be withdrawing that saving next year as well, pending um, a, a full review of all of the options going forward. And as I say, we need to, I think we need to uh, see a, a robust and sustainable plan in place so we, we are convinced that we can uh, make our savings but still have a good quality library offer going forward. Uh, third area on page seven I wanted to focus on is um, uh, the staff terms and conditions and um, just wanted to highlight the fact that we've, we've uh, been engaged over the last number of months in some very detailed negotiations with our trade union colleagues. Um, I'm pleased that we, I think in principle, have reached agreements around um, continuing to take the, the unpaid, four days unpaid leave for a period of five years, but also protecting our lowest paid staff um, through retaining the pay enhancements and the essential car use of allowances for the immediate future. And I know the, um, the trade unions are out of consultation with their members on that, but I think. Um, you know, that, that is a good deal going forward and, and that also comes in addition to, I think we need to emphasise this, retaining the very generous 1.4 multiplier that we are, uh, we are offering for EVR so that people who do leave this organisation can leave with a bit of dignity and financial, financial security. We're retaining that and the, the, the four full-time paying trade union officials which I think, you know, and I know we always have a um, uh, a debate uh, around this um, at council. I just think that's good industrial relations practice, and it makes for a um, you know a, a, a better kind of workforce if they've got proper representation. So I will, you know, I'm proud as a legal leader that we will continue with that, uh, that approach. Um, and then finally, um, on on the, the the area of leisure, um, our leisure services. Um, I mean, Alan. Alan Swan's talking about we need to invest in our leisure facilities. We've actually invested £2 million in upgrading our facilities, our leisure centres last year, and we've got further £2 million of capital funding invested in this year. Uh, and, uh, and it's great that we've seen a 25% uh, increase in, in use of our leisure centres, and it's partly because the offer is now much better than it, it, it was previously. One of the areas that, um, that uh, we were looking at possibly making savings was around concessions. I just wanted to make the point that you know I'm very proud of the fact that free swimming for children in school holidays was um, a Labour policy a number of years ago. I think it is important to retain that policy uh, of free swimming uh, for children, but we'll be focusing that at families who are most economically disadvantaged, and I think that meets our principle of protecting. You know, the most vulnerable communities and people who are, um, uh, are, are struggling. Uh, so we will protect free swimming for families who, who are most you know, disadvantaged. Um, so those, those are the areas that we are, we've listened to what the resident, uh, residents and the feedback have said uh, from the consultation, and those are the, the areas that we are uh, withdrawing uh, from the uh, savings uh, options that we've consulted with. So that finally leads me on to um, council tax. Um, sadly, the governments have again withdrawn the council tax freeze plans. So um, I'm afraid we're going to have to, because of the funding 
uh, puts the profit in, we'll get a 1.99% council tax increase um, next year. Uh, and I've obviously also, also mentioned the 2% uh, adult social care levy. Um, so that will, gen also will generate around about £4 million, pounds, which we will invest in, in those vital frontline services that, that I, I alluded to um, earlier on. But, um, you know, I wish that that council tax freeze map had been continued with. I think it's a shame um, that, that, that it wasn't. Uh, but my understanding is that the vast majority of councils in this uh, region are having to, um, to look at both of those, uh, those uh, areas. So, in conclusion, um, <coughs> I certainly believe this is, this is the most challenging budget that we've ever had to set. Uh, there's no, no two ways about it. These are extremely difficult decisions. But we do face a government that I think is, is um, not sympathetic to um, local government, particularly in the north of England. I, I don't know how anyone can draw any other conclusions from particularly the way that transitional funding was cynically used to fund councils in the south and predominantly Tory-run councils. Uh, you know, that is no way to run the country. Uh, really, um, you know, again, I, I hope that the government will, will rethink that. We do need to continue in our, our efforts to lobby government to change course. Um, anything that we can do to, um, to do that, we, we will happy, uh, we'll be happy to do that. And then finally, we, we've got a really um, big agenda of, of the next year around um, changing the way we deliver services because of the scale of the funding cuts that we face. Um, you know, th this, this is, I think, the most challenging time for local I know a, a number of local authorities around the country are saying to me is they don't think they'll be able to survive going forward. They simply won't have the resources to remain as, a, as a, an individual local authority. But we need to, to, to work really hard in terms of sharing costs, sharing services with neighbouring authorities, do, doing everything we can to make sure that we uh, can continue to provide those important frontline services. But I'm, I'm really proud of the fact that in spite of all of those really tough challenges, I think we are still, we're still on track to deliver our 20 pledges around those key uh, areas I've, I've alluded to, um, for people, business and the environment. Um, and for me and cabinet members hear me talk about this a lot at the moment, this is all about delivering outcomes for our residents. And I, I'm proud that we will be able to continue to do that, but recognising that we've got an incredibly challenging five years ahead of us. So that's all I want to say on, on the moving this resolution. I know Andy, you want to um, say a few words as well.